And with that, I would love to introduce Susan Gilliland, who will uh, introduce our speaker for tonight. Susan. Thank you, Ron. Well, we're really pleased to have Dr. John McCormick with us tonight. Dr. McCormick is director and curator of the Moore Laboratory of Zoology and an associate professor of biology at Occidental College. John received his PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology from UCLA and his undergraduate degree from the University of Arizona. Dr. McCormick studies the evolutionary history of birds and other organisms with genomic data. Specifically, he and his team use museum specimens and genomes to study the evolutionary history of birds, focusing especially on how both ancient landscape changes and more recent human-caused environmental changes affect birds' distributions, appearance, and DNA. John has multiple publications in peer-reviewed journals, including Evolution, Systema Systematic Biology, the AUK, which is now called Ornithology, and the Biological Journal of the Linnaean Society. Dr. McCormick serves on the board of the National Science Collections Alliance. As the director of the Moore Lab of Zoology and curator of its bird collection, John is a champion of museum collections and their potential for understanding and addressing the biodiversity crisis. Tonight, John will guide us through the rapid pace of technological change and how it's allowed the Moore Laboratory to decode the bird tree of life, learn how new bird species are formed, name new bird species, and uncover many secrets. So please welcome Dr. John McCormick. Thank you so much for that, Susan. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes we do. We can. Yes. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And hope that you can still hear me okay. Yes, you're still coming through loud and clear. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so Frank and Susan asked me to, to talk about using museum specimens in research and, and how they can be so useful, especially when you can extract DNA out of them. And so really, I mean, the main point I wanna get across is that museum specimens really are time portals. They can allow us to go back in time and address questions that really are historical questions that only can be tackled with museum specimens. Sometimes that's reconstructing past evolutionary events, and sometimes that's actually sampling from museum specimens that themselves are old and allow us a window into the time period when the bird was originally collected. And so, um, uh, as Susan mentioned, I'm over at the, the Moore Laboratory of Zoology at Occidental College. Pretty unusual to have a large bird collection uh, like the Moore Lab at a small liberal arts college. I like to say we certainly have the highest bird to student ratio of any of our peer institutions. Um, 63,000 birds. Uh, these were collected over the last hundred years but mainly from 1933 to 1955. Um, we have many species represented. It mainly focuses on the New World or the Americas. So we have about 2,000 of the 10,000 or so species represented in the collection. Um, we have an amazing hummingbird collection. 88% uh, of all species are represented in the Moore Lab. And lesser known, um, we're, we're mainly known as a Mexican bird collection, uh, 50,000 birds from Mexico, uh, but we also have a, a really good uh, collection from Ecuador, 6,000 specimens. And the history of this collection is kind of fun if you, if you don't know it. Uh, a fellow named Robert T. Moore moved to California from the East Coast in the late 1920s, like a lot of people, seeking sun and kind of a a new life for himself. And he decided when he arrived that he was going to kind of give up some of his business pursuits and some of his other pursuits and really focus on ornithology. And in particular, he set out to describe the birds of Mexico. And so what he did was he hired a professional collector named Chester Lamb, who had been hanging around Los Angeles since the late 1800s. Um, 
as a as a someone in the bird birder community or the ornithological community uh, from a long time ago. And so Moore hired him at the time Lamb was working for the BF Goodrich company. You can see a picture of him here. He's on the left. He was knocking in road signs for BF Goodrich and traveling all around the state in the West, collecting birds as he went along. But then Moore hired him and Lamb went down to Mexico and right away, you know, they had great success in the sense that uh, they discovered a new species, the tufted jay. This is kind of our Moore Lab logo. We have the holotype, the original specimen in the Moore Lab. And, um, you know, this is a type of bird that there's no other jay that looks anything like this in Mexico. And so when it was first seen, I mean, they, they knew they had a new species on their hands. Uh, Lamb went on to continue traveling around Mexico. He had his home in Guanajuato, and then he, he would travel around for 22 years collecting for more. And that's really how this collection got put together. Um, specimens being stashed away in Moore's home in Pasadena was on the, uh, the corner of mountain and hill. And then in 1951 is when Moore decided he really needed to take his collection out of his house and get it hooked up with an institution so it could kind of live for the long term. And he had been affiliated with Caltech, but Caltech was kind of already too far, uh, you know, towards tech and away from natural history. And so he, he brought his collection to Occidental College where it has stayed ever since. So we are using these specimens in all kinds of interesting ways. One of our major projects right now that I'm not, I'm not really gonna talk about here, it's kind of could be the subject of a whole other uh, seminar is the Mexican Bird Resurvey Project. So this is where we're using those specimens as time portals from the time they were collected, comparing the birds of Mexico today with the ones that were collected back in Lamb and Moore's time. And so um, obviously the ones from the 1930s, 40s and 50s are from the collection. And then our comparison material is observations collected from community science platforms like eBird. And so we're kind of just beginning a big countrywide effort to to see how the birds have changed in Mexico over the last hundred years and try to understand some of the drivers behind that change, um, like climate change or, or habitat loss or, or other things. We tried to get at like which particular bird groups might've been more heavily impacted, which eco regions in Mexico. So, um, you know, when you're talking about museum specimens and you're talking to a, a birding group, you know, there, there's always, there's always this tension, right? I mean, I mean, I know a lot of you don't, don't like to see images of dead birds, or maybe you understand the utility, but it still, it still bothers. And I get that. That tension really actually goes back a really long ways, um, all the way back to when the Audubon, Pasadena Audubon was, was first founded. In fact, before the Audubon was founded here, um, there was an entity called the Cooper Club, and they were ornithologists who were really into collecting and describing new birds, new species, new subspecies, and um, they formed in the late 1800s. And they would get together in these groups, you see a picture here from about 1900, um, take their guns down into the Arroyo Seco and, and collect. I mean, that, that's how we discovered what was out there and, and how we, um, you know, describe things and new varieties and, and new subspecies. And, and that's really how it was done. And then in about 1904, and, and kind of at that time, everybody who was interested in birds was part of the Cooper Club. But there was always this sort of tension there were the people who were more into watching the birds who weren't really professional or amateur ornithologists. And we're interested in conserving birds. And that sort of led to a bit of a, a splintering of the two. And so in 1904, that's when W. Scott Way um, formed the Audubon Society. But before that, he actually resigned from the Cooper Club because he just um, was really just flat out against taking birds of, of any kind for, for specimens. And so kind of interesting, um, the people that really sort of bridged the gap 
and almost kept these two groups together. There were people that splintered away, but um, the people that sort of held the two together were, were a family uh, called the Grinnells. So you may have heard of Joseph Grinnell. He went on to become one of the greatest naturalists, uh, certainly of California and maybe of the Western United States, um, a scientist, professional ornithologist, who became the head of the uh, Museum of Vertebrate Zoology at Berkeley. But back in the day, in the late 1800s, he was actually, Susan, the original young Pasadena birder. And his mother really may have been almost like the first helicopter mom. Um, not that there were helicopters back then, but she really, you know, back then, you know, I think people maybe neglected their kids a little more than they do today, but she did not. She really took a very proactive, um, hands-on approach with her kids and giving them every opportunity to go out there and see birds and collect birds. And so um, Elizabeth Grinnell especially was not only a founding member of the Audubon Society in Pasadena, um, but she was also um, a member, obviously, of the Cooper Club, and her son was really the founding member of the Cooper Club. And so these photos um, I dug up in the archives of the Bancroft Library at Berkeley. Elizabeth Grinnell, wonderful, super interesting figure. I mean, I think not enough has been written and said about her. She was an author. She wrote many books in the late 1800s, early 1900s about birds and the birds of Pasadena. And actually, I've looked at this picture a number of times. I saw it in person and then took a photo of it. And um, one thing I never noticed about this photo um, was that Elizabeth Grinnell is looking there at a hummingbird nest. I just kind of thought she was like, you know, gazing into the foliage or something. But no, she's, she's checking out a hummingbird nest there. And I thought this would be kind of a cool opportunity to really get at the utility of museum specimens at time as time portals to ask the question, well, what was this hummingbird probably uh, that she was looking at here? So I don't know if we have the, yeah, I guess we have the chat feature enabled or we got Q&A. Maybe we don't need to like do a call and response, but maybe just in your head, um, you know, ask yourself what you think, what species do you think this hummingbird was? Take a moment to, to take a guess. So what I did was I went into a database called VertNet, this is a database of all US bird collections. These are specimens. And I narrowed my search down to um, you know, trying to figure out what were hummingbirds that were breeding in Pasadena around the year 1900. That's about when that photo was taken. And so I limited the search to hummingbird specimens between 1870 and 1920. And I selected for June only, uh, cut out everything else to try to get at breeding hummingbirds. And then I limited my search to Los Angeles County and then only localities that had Pasadena. So I did a really, really restrictive search. And it returned 36 hummingbird specimens. And uh, let's see what the answers were here. So there were only two, so maybe, maybe you went with the two most common hummingbirds around Pasadena today, which would be Anna's and Allen's hummingbirds. But it turns out that neither of those species was particularly common down kind of in the city of Pasadena back in the day. Uh, so only a couple Anna's hummingbirds collected. And actually Anna's hummingbirds tend to nest a little bit higher up than that bird was seen. And so uh, much more common specimens were black-chinned hummingbirds and costas hummingbirds, which, you know, it's got probably a little bit surprising. Both of those nest a little lower in the foliage. And so, uh, you know, th this bird that Elizabeth Grinnell was looking at is as likely to be a costas or a black-chinned uh, as it was anything else. And so this is just, you know, I, I put this together just a couple of days ago because I thought it'd be fun and really get across the ability of museum specimens to, to be able to take us back in time and answer historical questions. Um, 
you know, again, a whole seminar, we could talk about the spread of Allen's hummingbirds as a breeding bird in the interior of Los Angeles. That's actually a pretty new phenomenon as sedentary non-migratory Allen's hummingbirds moved over from Catalina Island and then began to, to spread all over. Before that, in Elizabeth Grinnell's day, Allen's was mainly a, just a, a migrant that was passing through. So, um, okay, that's a little bit about just museum specimens in general, the specimens themselves, when and where they were collected. Now I wanna dig a little bit more into the idea that specimens have DNA that's contained within them and then what we can do when we extract that DNA out. So I'm gonna play a little clip for you here. This is from a movie, uh, a short video um, we put together that's about the Mexican Bird Resurvey Project. Uh, you can look it up on the internet or on YouTube, very easy to find if you put in records of change. Um, it's a really well-produced uh, video. And this little clip is just kind of showing you what we do. There's Chester Lamb uh, looking over Whitney from the Moore Lab as she takes a knife to one of his precious specimens, cuts off a little piece of the toe and then places it in a tube to basically dissolve it and get little tiny broken pieces of DNA out. And then we take that DNA over to um, our new genomics center. So we've just gone through a, a big remodel at the Moore Lab and we kind of have our twin um, areas now. We've got this sort of vintage old bird collection and we have this super new modern genomic center right next door. And so you take that little toe pad clipping, you bring it over to this lab and you start the process of extracting and sequencing that DNA. Um, this whole idea of getting DNA out of museum specimens is not really that old. Um, the very first DNA anyone got out of a museum specimen was from a, a quagga. It was a, a now extinct subspecies of the zebra in 1984. So this pelt was in a museum about 100 years old and um, they had to take kind of large-ish, much larger quantities than, than we took of that little toe pad to get enough DNA to be able to work with. Um, well, fast forward, what, uh, 35, 36 years or so, and now we're able to extract large quantities of DNA out of a little tiny piece of a mammoth tooth that's not 100 years old, but actually 1.7 million years old. So we have continued to push the dates back and back and back on old specimens that we can actually extract DNA from. And one of the reasons behind that uh, has to do with uh, our changes to DNA sequencing technologies. So uh, DNA sequencing is another thing that is not terribly old. Uh, it was first invented in 1977 by Fred Sanger. Um, sometimes it's called Sanger sequencing, uh, the, the particular type of sequencing that he, he invented. And um, sometimes also called D-dioxy sequencing. And this is really the, the kind of sequencing that I did for my PhD dissertation. Um, I guess that is just probably going to start to, to date me a little bit. But the key here was that you did it on these plastic plates that had 96 wells on them. And in each well, you put a little sample that you were just going to get a little piece of DNA from. And maybe you could only do 96 individuals at a time or whatever. You'd get 96 chunks of DNA back for months and months of work. And you had to do lots of optimizing before you ever did the sequencing. Now, fast forward to today, we have a new type of DNA sequencing technology that was invented in 2005. And really, you know, people talk about sort of game changers or disruptive technology or kind of like paradigm shift, something that just totally changes the way something is done. This was not just about getting faster or getting smaller. They really kind of invented a new way to sequence DNA and to, to read the sequences. And so now what happens on this tiny little, what they call a flow cell, you throw 
all kinds of pieces of DNA from all kinds of different organisms or individuals that you're studying. And those DNA, basically, I mean, I'm not gonna go into the details, but it falls into to essentially billions of little nano wells, not 96, but billions of them that are scattered on this flow cell. And you literally, instead of a hundred sequences, you get hundreds of millions back. And so it is just, it's like turning on the, the, the spigot in terms of the amount of DNA we've gotten back. And that's how we can go from a short sequence of a, of a quagga to a whole genome of a mammoth that's almost 2 million years old. Uh, the big difference there is that uh, now that we get all these sequences back, it's shifted a lot of the work to computational type work, computer type work on the back end after you get the sequences back. So I'm not gonna go too deep into the weeds. I did just wanna talk a little bit about our method for the pieces of DNA we grab and then what we do with them when we get them. Um, so we've just got a couple more slides here on the methods. Um, our method is focused on using ultra conserved chunks of DNA in animal genomes, uh, essentially as anchors to be able to grab and pull chunks of DNA out. So we're not dealing with the whole genome because it's just too big, it's too crazy, it's too complicated. We don't wanna deal with all that. And so we've decided we just wanna pull little pieces out. And so it's kind of fascinating. Um, the probes were designed, this is by uh, my collaborator, Brant Faircloth, who's at LSU now. Um, we call these UCEs, ultra conserved elements. And if you align the genomes, the genomes are out there of like the lizard and uh, a couple birds, you'll find these stretches of DNA that don't differ at all between those species, even though they're, you know, a lizard and a bird are really, really uh, divergent from each other evolutionarily. Um, there's these certain chunks of DNA that just don't seem to have evolved at all. And people are still kind of trying to figure out exactly what they do and what their purpose is. Um, we don't really care so much what their purpose is. We just design little probes off of them that act as anchors. And so you find one of these UCE regions, you design a probe that is essentially, think of it like a little magnet. And then you can throw that magnet in with any other bird you might be interested in studying and yank that little chunk of DNA out from every single individual or every single species. And so we do that with um, 5,000 different regions. And these regions are about 1,000 base pairs long. And so that ends up giving us about 5 million um, regions of DNA to look at. And now just to talk a little bit about what we do with that DNA when we get it. Um, so perhaps you noticed, if you know your, your species designations, that these are not birds, they're frogs in the genus Rana. So just ignore that for the moment, right? It's all Latin to us, so just assume these are birds. Um, here's DNA sequence data. Assume this is one of these chunks of DNA that we've managed to yank out, and it's all the same chunk for five different birds slash frogs, we start looking at where they share mutations. And particularly, we're looking for what we call shared novel or derived mutations. And so when we find a bunch of them that link two individuals or two species together, we then put those close to each other on the tree of life. And so here we've got C's and C's, A's and A's that differ from the G's below or the T's below. And so we wanna put these two species close to one another and say that they share a recent common ancestor. And then we can also do that in a few positions here to say these two probably have a recent common ancestor. And then there's a few areas where all four of these species share the same mutation. And so we say all four of these probably have a recent common ancestor that goes even further back in time. So that's really, um, it's a bit more complicated than that. There's all kinds of little uh, 
nuances and, and problems that arise. But that's the basic idea for how you go from DNA sequence data to starting to build um, the tree of life. And then another fun thing we can do is we can take that tree and we can start to calibrate these divergence events to real time units. Right now, they're just in terms of how many DNA mutations. But perhaps we know that these two species occur on one side of a mountain range, and these two species occur on another side of a mountain range. And then maybe we know something about when that mountain range actually rose up and originated um, from separate data, from geology or, or some other source of data. We know that it was 2 million years ago. So now all of a sudden we can put a little calibration on that node and say, this was 2 million years ago right here. And so these other nodes, you know, this was probably 4 million years ago. And these other nodes closer in were about 1 million years ago. And we can start to get real time units on the tree of life. So that in a one slide nutshell is actually a lot of what we do in the Moore lab. It's a lot of the studies. And you may be thinking, okay, like I'm just into birds and looking at them because I think they're cool. Who cares about all that stuff? But I'm gonna make the argument that certain birds become a heck of a lot cooler when you know their evolutionary history. So let's take the wren tit. Um, I mean, it is a very cool bird. Uh, you hear it a lot more than you see it. And it's got some interesting behaviors and it's got a in, kind of an interesting look. Uh, otherwise, a bit of a nondescript bird, right? It's not exactly um, super flashy. Uh, but wren tits are super interesting when you look at their position in the tree of life. Um, it turns out, uh, here I'm showing you a, a phylogeny, a more complicated one than the one I just showed you. And it has real time units up here at the top from today, going back to 5 million years, going back to 10 million years. And over here is the wren tit. And by putting together this tree of life, we find that not only is the closest living relative to wren tit, you have to go all the way back past 10 million years ago to find that living relative on earth, but also it's the only member in its family that is in the Americas. All the rest of its close relatives on Earth in this family called Paradox Ornithidae are, um, are elsewhere in the old world. And so that makes the wren tit really cool, right? Because, I mean, something happened for this species to be in the Americas. Either it was some crazy dispersal event where it made it over the Bering Strait or over the ocean somehow and made it over to the Americas 10 million years ago, or almost just as cool, it's the sole survivor of a bunch of other species that were in the Americas, but they all went extinct except for the wren tit. And the wren tit is just kind of holding on. And so, I don't know, for me, that makes the wren tit a whole lot cooler when, when you see it in nature and makes some of its intriguing qualities um, a, a lot more understandable. Um, it also, kind of becomes important for conservation. Uh, these phylogenies, trees, tree of life can, can uncover new and interesting relationships. Uh, tell you about one here, the Hawaiian honey eaters. So uh, there were birds in the Hawaiian islands that were called honey eaters because they looked a lot like birds that were called honey eaters that were in Asia. And honey eaters are cool. They have these interesting tongue morphologies that uh, allow them to slurp up and soak up nectar from flowers. And um, the honey eaters in Hawaii have it, the honey eaters over in um, Australasia and Asia have it as well. And so they were all, all, all different, but all considered to be honey eaters in the same family. And then one day, uh, we used DNA to put together one of these trees of life. And we found in fact that the true honey eaters from New Zealand, Australia, Samoa were, uh, let's say down here in the tree of life, 
kind of near some other things that are found in Australia. But these so-called honey eaters from Hawaii were not closely related to them at all. They were in a totally different part of the tree of life, actually um, kind of more closely related to things like wax wings, like cedar wax wing or phenopepla. And in fact, these Hawaiian honey eaters were a whole new family and they were so divergent from everything else uh, that they named them the Mohoaday. And that family on the Hawaiian islands uh, was like 14 to 17 million years old before it was related to anything else on earth. And so um, this is a great example with these convergent morphologies of what we call convergent evolution, similar lifestyle, similar niche, similar thing that they're feeding. So even though they're not closely related, they sort of end up looking similar and throw people off for many years until we look at the DNA. So the sad story here is that the only reason we were able to get DNA from these Hawaiian honey eaters was from museum skins because um, the description of this new family, the Mohoaday, was actually also their, their epitaph. Um, they're entirely extinct now, um, driven extinct by a lot of causes on the Hawaiian islands, including avian malaria, habitat destruction. The very last sighting of a Hawaiian honey eater was the Kauai O'o uh, in 1985. And when that individual died, it took the entire family along with it. So um, that's a sad story, but I think it's another story about why understanding a little bit about evolutionary history and these uh, bird, bird tree of life is, is enhances our understanding and appreciation of birds. And in fact, even some conservation outfits use it um, in their conservation priorities. So there's a there's one um, conservation group that, that uses edge species, they call them edge species, for evolutionarily distinct and globally endangered. And so they use two criteria here. So the wren tit, um, even though it's evolutionary, evolutionarily distinct, it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't rank as an edge species because it's not endangered. It's actually doing, doing pretty well. Um, so that's not an edge species, but something like the California condor is because it's both evolutionarily distinct and it's also globally endangered. Um, okay, so now I'm just going to talk about a couple projects we have had in the Moore Lab that use these techniques um, to understand something about uh, bird groups. And the main theme of these is using museum specimens and DNA from museum specimens uh, to study rare or endangered species, um, basically samples we would never get again today. We would never collect these birds. We would never want to collect them because they're not doing well. And so really the DNA that's in those old museum specimens is probably the only DNA we're ever gonna get. And so we've done a couple studies on birds like this. And the first one I'm gonna tell you about is the genus of wood quail or wood partridges um, in the genus Dendrortix. You may not be familiar with this genus. These birds are really cool. They're really hard to see. Um, and they're, they're kind of, they're, they're in the family New World quail. So they're sort of vaguely closely related to our California quail, but they're, they're bigger and, and quite a bit more secretive, much more often heard than seen in the forests of Mexico and Central America. I'm just gonna, this is an incredible photo of one. I mean, you would spend your whole life trying to get this good of a view of a long-tailed wood partridge. Here is the, uh, the song that you might hear in the forest. So very cool birds. We um, used entirely museum specimens from the Moore Lab to put together this little evolutionary tree of the three described species in this genus. So you have the, the one I was just showing you, the long-tailed wood partridge that is distributed around several highland regions in Mexico here in the yellow. 
And then you have the bearded wood partridge that is in the green. And this one actually is endangered, very narrow geographic range and um, declining populations. And then another species over here in the purple that's down in, um, in some of the countries of Central America. So when we put together this phylogeny, um, we found a couple things. Number one, that the divergences within this genus, they go back, I mean, for, for birds and genus, I mean, it, it's actually not like a super long time, but you know, three, four million years when they first started to diverge from one another. And that divergence happened across a, a biogeographic feature of Mexico called the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. Don't try to say that three times fast. And then another cool thing we found is that within this widespread species, the long-tailed wood partridge, again, these sort of isolated island regions in Mexico, we found that each little isolated region seemed to have its own grouping. So the birds that were from Oaxaca, they formed a group. The birds that Oaxaca is down here, the birds from Guerrero, they formed a group. And then the birds from Mexico and Puebla up here, they formed a group. And so that suggested that there were also some kind of novel and interesting evolutionary lineages uh, within this one species. Um, and so this kind of takes us into this idea that using these techniques, we sometimes uncover new local endemic lineages that add knowledge to conservation efforts. So I'm gonna walk you through one more study that we did on a bird that had a pretty similar geographic distribution. This is a fairly close relative of our local California scrub jay, a bird called the unicolored jay, a Felicoma unicolor. So unlike the dendrotix wood quail, the uh, unicolored jay, this was just one, currently described as just one species with, but with a similar distribution to the dendrotix wood, uh, wood partridges. And we use similar techniques here. We sampled from specimens from each of these regions. And then we put together a little tree of life. And we found again that each one of these regions with different symbols fell out into its own evolutionary group, its own evolutionary lineage. And what you may start to notice is that some of those match up with what we found in Dendrotex. For example, Oaxaca here in the blue dots uh, is a distinct evolutionary thing. Um, that one is, I think, down back here. So if we then start to combine the results of many different studies, it allows you to start to draw broader conclusions, not only about evolution, but about conservation priorities. So for example, um, you have this break, this evolutionary divergence that happened across the Isthmus of Tehuantepec in both species about 3 million years ago. So that clues you into the idea that something interesting may have happened. This geographic barrier may have in fact really formed um, about 3 million years ago, or maybe there was some sort of water inundation that happened. This is actually a lowland area that divided these two areas. Um, another area that, that agreed between the studies is that you have endemic local lineages in Oaxaca, in Guerrero, and also in the Sierra Madre Oriental, and then in regions to the east of the Isthmus of Tehuantepec that are each about one to two million years old. And so again, this just sort of clues you in like, these are little epicenters, little mini epicenters of biodiversity creation. And you might wanna think about starting to protect them. If you were to just consider the unicolor J one monolithic species, you're like, okay, they're kind of everywhere, they're doing well, um, not that interesting. But all of a sudden with this kind of a study, you're like, wow, there's these little distinct things that are popping up in each of these places. And, and they look distinct too. So, um, and, and then we can also, one of, one of the things in the Moore lab that we're always quite interested in is then trying to figure out exactly why these divergences happened. So in the case of dendrotics and the unicolored jays, um, 
it seemed that it was probably more habitat changes and fragmentation during the ice ages over the last two, two and a half million years that caused these divergence events and, and new lineages to form more than things like mountain formation, which was much longer ago. Okay, well, this always gets people thinking about that ever murky topic of what really constitutes a new species. And so um, there's a lot of ways you could uh, describe and, and, and criteria you could use to make a case that these lineages might be separate species instead of just being subspecies. Uh, some people use what, what we call the phenotype or the appearance of the bird. So in the case of unicolored jays, each one of these did sort of have a, a you know, they, they look kind of the same, but they each had a different shade of color and differences in their tail length and things that made them unique. Um, other people want to look at just the phylogeny and look for these distinct lineages. And in the case of unicolored jays, you, you find them. Uh, but there's always this question that you come to, especially if you um, are a, a practitioner of a certain species concept called the biological species concept, you get to this question of would they interbreed? And here you really don't know, right? Because they're in these isolated mountain ranges and they don't come into contact. And so you don't know what would happen if they came back together. And so that uncertainty for some people is kind of an open question and it's an open question enough that they would not want to elevate these to, to species level. And so actually a proposal was put in to the North American Checklist Committee to split them. And the decision of that committee was that at this time with what we know now, they did not want to divide these up and call them separate species. So they're still all the unicolor J. Um, this decision was uh, a little different from a, another study we worked on several years ago with our local scrub Js. And in this case, we did, uh, did, did a similar type of study that showed that the scrub Js all along the coast, the Pacific coast, including California and Baja were quite different genetically from all of the scrub jays that were in the interior US going down into Mexico. And the level of the differences were really pretty similar to the unicolor jays, but there was a big difference, which is that the scrub jays actually did come together in a contact area in the desert just east of Lake Tahoe. And where they did, we were able to show that they had reduced levels of interbreeding with each other, suggesting that they were sort of well on their way to becoming separate species. So in this case, um, we put in a proposal to split them. And uh, they used to be called Western scrub jay. Many of you probably still wish they were called Western scrub jay, uh, but we split them up into California scrub jay and Woodhouse's scrub jay. Okay, so the last little story I wanna tell you about um, is about using museum specimens um, truly as portals, time portals to allow us to go, to go back in time and, and uh, to, to sample DNA from a time we normally wouldn't have access to. And this gets us into the fun story of the Los Angeles parrots. So you may know we have a lot of different parrot and parakeet species that roam around wild in the city. Some of them are established and they're breeders. Um, I'm going to focus in on two of the most common ones, and especially the most common ones in Pasadena, the red-crowned and the lilac-crowned parrots. This may not be the picture you expected to see next, um, Richard Nixon watering his roof, but what this does is takes us into some of the, the fun stories about how the parrots got into the city and out of captivity. Uh, one of the stories revolves around the Bel Air fire of 1961 that displaced a number of movie stars as well as then Pre Vice President Richard Nixon. And there were also a number of aviaries in the neighborhood that apparently their owners opened up as the fire closed in and released a bunch of yellow-headed parrots into the neighborhood that were seen for a long time afterwards. And you know, it was not just one event. I think that the real story here is that there were, there's probably some truth behind the Bel Air fire or the pet store fire in Pasadena. 
Um, but even before the Bel Air fire and before any of these other incidents, local fish and wildlife were noticing persisting flocks of parrots, um, even back into the mid 1950s. And so it, it probably just a number of releases, both small and large uh, through the years. Um, you know, there's another local legend that Bush Gardens might have played a role here. This was <laughs> an amusement park built on the theme of free beer and exotic birds, you know, what could go wrong? I think a few parrots might have escaped. And uh, as for the red crowned parrots, which is really the most common one, the very first records of them were from 1963. Actually, my predecessor in the Moore Lab, Bill Hardy, was the first to record a very small flock of red crowned parrots hanging out with some yellow headed parrots in Pasadena. Bill Hardy was an interesting guy. When he wasn't being curator, he also started a jazz record label in Los Angeles. You can check out the offerings of Revelation Records. Uh, well, fast forward to today, the parrots got established and they now number well over 5,000 individuals. And they were eventually joined by another species, the lilac crown parrot that numbers well over a thousand. And, um, you know, their homeland, they, they are hanging out in the city together now, but they really evolutionarily speaking, have never seen each other uh, in millions of years. They occupy different sides, different coasts of Mexico, and they're about a million years divergent from one another. So you can kind of think of them as long lost cousins here. Um, and the question we wanted to ask was, are these birds hybridizing? Are they forming hybrids? Uh, but to do that, we couldn't use the birds in Los Angeles, right? Because we didn't know if they were hybrids or not. We, we really wanted to get pure DNA from before the time the birds were even in the pet trade were brought to Los Angeles. And so, um, you know, to put that another way, we needed a baseline of historical species differences. And this is where it comes in pretty handy to be the curator of the Mexican bird collection because we had many examples of both species that were collected in the 1930s, long before the pet trade. And so we extracted DNA, just like I told you about before, and we were able to find 214 DNA sites where red crown parrots and lilac crown parrots always differed from one another. And then what we did is we assembled a small group of 22 modern parrots from Los Angeles, um, including a bird we called Billy. Uh, Billy was a bird that struck a plate glass window at the library at Occidental College, scared the heck out of an undergrad who was just trying to study. By the time we got there, Billy was stone dead. Um, we named the dead parrot Billy, I'm not sure why, but it became kind of a, a, an important specimen because we looked at it and we knew right away that this bird looked like a hybrid between a, a red crowned and a lilac crowned parrot, um, had features of both. Um, I didn't show it to you on the, uh, when I showed you the pictures of the parrots, but uh, over here you have red crowned. They tend to not have this sort of scalloping. Here we have lilac crowned. Lilac crowned has scalloping on the breast. The red crowned has kind of a, a plain smooth breast and belly. And then the red crowned has more of a cherry red where the lilac crowned has more of a, a maroon red. And so Billy had elements of both. What I'm showing you here is kind of like a genetic survey. All of these birds on the bottom are, these are individual birds. And then each bar is how much DNA it has from lilac crown parrot and how much DNA it has from red crown parrot. And what I'm showing you right now are the ones we sampled from the 1930s in Mexico. So four lilac crown parrots, and of course they're pure, and four red crown parrots and they're pure. And then I'm going to show you when we told this computer program, tell us what Billy is. Billy came out as almost like a 50-50 hybrid. And then when we filled in the rest of the parrots, we found something interesting. There weren't a lot of birds that were like Billy. 
There were a few others that were like pretty serious hybrids, but most of the other ones, let me just make them appear here again. Most of the other ones were like nearly pure red crowns or nearly pure lilac crowns. But interestingly, they were never totally pure. Every single bird we sampled had like a little sliver of DNA from the other species. So just to kind of sum that up really quick, um, you know, the museum samples were so important in allowing, uh, allowing us to establish a baseline. The two species were really genetically distinct in Mexico and in SoCal hybrids do exist. Um, they're not super common, but all of the parrots do have like a little sliver. So it's kind of an interesting and sort of a nuanced story. And it plays into conservation because both of these species are critically endangered in Mexico. This is an iNaturalist photo of a red crowned parrot from its native range over in Northeastern Mexico. And some speculate uh, because of the pet trade and because of habitat loss that there may be more of the parrots in Southern California than in Mexico. And there's even this sort of whimsical idea that we might even harbor almost like a rescue or a just in case population here in Los Angeles. But our study cautions that, you know, a lot of these SoCal parrots are like close to pure, but they're not totally pure. And so um, I think what we need to do is really start doing some official, official monitoring of the parrots in SoCal. Kimball does a great job with some of these censuses, but, um, you know, maybe officials need to, to start taking a look as well. Um, given some of the uncertainties, the best thing for now is to conserve the parrots in their native range in Mexico and not count on our Los Angeles parrots as being a backup population. So that sort of wraps things up. The take home messages here that I want you to know, museum specimens really are time portals. They allow us to go back in time they allow us to activate research on bird taxonomy and bird conservation. And they allow us to look at the genomes of the past and ask interesting questions that really enhance our appreciation of the birds around us. Couple closing messages. Hey, send us undergrads. If you know an ornitholo ornithologically inclined young person in your life, we have this great bird collection. We have this new wonderful genomic center and we are doing great work there. And we have more and more students that are coming because they're into birds and we have got kind of a great group going. So um, get in touch if you're interested. We don't just study the dead birds. We also study the live one. If you saw Ryan uh, last week or a couple weeks ago, he talked about our new migration counting location up at Bear Divide where you can see thousands of birds migrating over this low saddle in the mountains in a given day. So some cool stuff, the Moore Lab is expanding out into live bird studies in the city. I hope you can come to visit soon this new remodel I've been talking about. See the bird collection, see this wonderful new mural we've got, Southern California from Sea to Sky, painted by Jane Kim, Jane Kim of Inkdwell Studios. Um, we hope that things uh, improve with our public health situation and you can come visit soon. Thank you so much. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Fantastic. Ryan, that was wonderful. Thank you very, very, uh, Ryan, excuse me. <laughs> John, that was wonderful. Thank you. I, I was thinking bear divide. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let me just change the view so that we don't bounce back and forth. Okay. Um, yes, we do have a question. If you have any questions um, for John, please pop them into our Q&A section so we can keep track of it. Uh, the first one, um, John, do you want to read the question or do you want me to read the question to you? I don't know what you where, reference. Where are we? What percent of the J's collected? Is that where we are? No, we're in the Q&A section. Oh, the Q&A. Oh, I'm sorry. I was in the chat. Um, what can the Moore Lab specimens tell us about whether the Mexican barred owl is a legit full species or is it a just, just a barred owl subspecies? 
Yeah, I mean, that is literally exactly the type of question we can address with more lab specimens. There's just all kinds of little studies like that that are waiting to be done in the more lab. 65,000 specimens, great sampling from all over Mexico, and um, you know, hundreds of studies just, just waiting to be done. Absolutely. Uh, Have you got specimens of the Mexican Bardell? That is a great question that I don't know. I'd have to go on to Arctos and take a look, Lance. But if you wanna, if you wanna talk more about that, we can take a look together and, and see what we've got. Cool. Do we have scrub jay specimens from Baja, California? Seem that they are phenotypically different than our California scrub jays. Has anybody studied those? As it turns out, we don't have a lot of specimens from two places in Mexico, Baja, California and the Yucatan. And that is not because, I once speculated that perhaps Chester Lamb hated peninsulas, but it's not the case. Actually, he collected the Baja Peninsula when he worked for the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology at Berkeley. And so all of his scrub jays he collected there are up at Berkeley. Um, so we don't have them, but Berkeley does. And there are a couple interesting subspecies down there that need careful study. There's one called Cactophila, right? That hangs out in the cactus fields, central Baja, um, kind of interesting. And then the ones down in the southern tip of Baja are also distinct and no one has taken a careful look. In that study I showed you, um, we, we did a little bit of gene genetic sampling, but it needs a, a much broader survey. Cool. Is there any species the lab is specifically studying right now? Two that we are really into um, at the moment, we are looking at lilac crown parrots in their native range. There's actually some interesting geographic variation going on in Mexico. And so we're doing a range wide look. We've also got student projects fired up on green jays, which are just amazing and highly variable throughout Mexico and have a difference in their iris color. As you go from Northern, uh, Southern Texas and Northern Mexico down South, you go from a dark eyed green jay to a yellow eyed green jay. And then we have amazing samples of Stellar's Jays. As you can tell, I'm really into Jays. <laughs> <laughs> and so we've got a big uh, Stellar's Jay study going on as well. And probably, you know, several others I'm, I'm kind of blanking on right now. Yeah, Lily, you have to go check out the Moore Lab. That would be an exciting place to visit. And Absolutely. Or... Yeah. Um, let's see, what percentage of the Jays collected in the Pine Nut Mountains north of Topaz Lake show evidence of hybridization did the results from your study mirror the study done from, by Delaney? We see hybrids south to Walker in the Antelope Valley, Mono County. Yeah. So the Pine Nut Mountains and the Virginia Mountains are like the epicenter of the hybrid zone. So a lot of, or most of the birds you see there actually are hybrids, even if it's kind of hard to tell. Mm -hmm. And then the hybrid zone stretches from a bit north of there, kind of all the way down to the southeast um you know for several hundred miles so it, it's like a it's a pretty wide i mean i guess it's a pretty wide hybrid zone sort of narrow when you consider the whole ranges of both species but it goes for for several hundred kilometers great um, um any pop back in i don't see anything more in the chat um and i see a couple more in the q a yeah, any specimens of red crown parrots from the escaped population in South Texas? Um, oh. Yeah, we don't have them, but they are being studied by a, a researcher, um, Don Brightsmith, I think, in, in Texas. And some people think actually they might not be escapes, but it might be a natural range expansion. And, and that's something I think they, they hope to get at with genetic data. Um, Green jays also are expanding their range north in Southern Texas and uh, as well as a bunch of other species. Um, Lance asks, what's the most numerous species in the Mexican part of the Moore Lab collection? Yeah, we have scads of acorn woodpeckers, <laughs> um, Northern flickers, Stellar's jays, 
I'm trying to think of some of the other ones that just go on for trays and trays. Um, and these are just so ripe for, for great projects, right? Because you can get really good sample sizes. Um, you know, they were collected from, you know, over the course of 30 years, right? Just a few from here and there from all over. So this didn't like wipe out full populations, um, but it really does allow you to get a, a nice sample size and really get at fine scale geographic variation mm -hmm. and identify these local endemic populations. Cool, cool. And do you see the Q and A? Um, do you want John, John Dunn asks another question? Oh yeah, the Sumacras J has very different calls. It does, and we they they are distinct. The Sumacras these are the scrub jays that are down in like central Mexico. Okay, and they're distinct. They are distinct from the other woodhouses. They're currently lumped with woodhouses J. They sound different. They are phenotypically different. And we took a look at the contact zone between them. And it was sort of broad enough that we didn't feel at this time there was a solid case for dividing them up into species. We may go at it later with a little harder data, um, but for now we, we sort of laid off it. Okay, cool. Lance popped in with another. Yeah, well, here Lance has got a whole other uh, study for us on the red crossbills. I mean, I, I know we have a lot of crossbills in the collection, but I really don't know much about the specific um, differences you're talking about here. But yeah, I mean, th these are the kinds of questions. And this is really where birding knowledge sort of meets the Moore Lab and museum collections to be able to generate some of these novel um, and interesting questions that can be addressed with museum specimens. I mean, you're, you're the ones that are out there seeing these things and seeing these differences. And then we can go into the collection and, and see what we see with the DNA and with the appearance of the birds. Cool. And, oh, and any other questions for Dr. McCormick? I don't see anything coming in on q a or chat well we just want to thank you very much for presenting for us tonight um it was fascinating all around and we have it's such a jewel to have here uh in the la area pasadena area let alone um we have the museum of natural history and uh, the moore lab and we are we are really blessed to have such great museums and great specimens uh, Mark and Susan Frank, is there anything else that we need to, that we should cover? No, just thank John very much for a fascinating and well-presented seminar. It was great. Yes. Thank you so much. And I really do hope to see all of you at the Moore Lab soon. And if you have other questions or interests, um, you know, just drop me a line. Let's chat. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And if you have any uh, any follow up questions, you can um, uh, drop them actually on our website at labirders.org. We have a contact us, pop anything in there. We'll be glad to forward it, forward the question and we'll um, put it up on our, any answers on our site. Yeah. And let me just say if kind of the place where we're most active right now, you know, if you want to see what's going on daily at the Moore Lab, um, our Instagram page is really where, where we're doing a, a lot these days. So that's MLZ birds on Instagram. So you can check us out there. What's MLZ stand for? More lab zoology. Oh, okay. MLZ birds. Yeah. I was thinking more, I was trying to figure out how that came in with the oxy, <laughs> but no. right. Well, fantastic. Thank you so much, John. And uh, John Dunn has another uh, oh. comment about uh, uh, that common mergansers should be uh, looked at as well. Okay, where? In the Q and A. <laughs> In the Q &A. Okay. The common mergansers should be looked at. Well, I will first thing tomorrow go <laughs> gander at them. Gander at the mergansers. <laughs> That's right. That's a There's a bird go joke. Goose gander at them. Yes. <laughs> well, we'll end with a very bad bird joke. Ah, uh, yes. of course. So bad bird pun. And oh. I'm sorry, we had another Q and A pop oh, in, wow. and again, old world. Oh, old and world. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, we wouldn't have any old world stuff um, really in the Moore Lab, but yeah, I'll, I'll look at them anyways because they're beautiful. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, Calvin Bond asks one more question. I'm happy to happy to keep answering. Yeah. Do the Swainson's hawks that winter in Mexico differ genetically from the ones that winter in Argentina and Central America? Mm -hmm. I have absolutely no idea. Um, but it is yet another question that potentially could be addressed. As you can imagine, we don't have a lot of raptors in the collection, but we have more raptors in the collection in Mexico than will ever be collected again ever. And so um, we, we have not done much with them genetically. Mm -hmm. And I'd say that's another group that's really ripe for study. You know, I fell asleep there for a second. Did you say you had a lot of Swainson's hawks in your collection? I, I don't know, um, uh, but we do have a lot of raptors. Um, oh, okay. Not, not like a lot, but more than will ever be collected again, for sure. Right. Uh, right. And we haven't done many studies on the, on the raptors in the collection. Interesting. Yeah. So there's a lot of opportunity for uh, undergrads, Calvin. Indeed. Absolutely. And oh, another q and I'm sorry, they keep coming in, which is great. I apologize. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, studying see. fox sparrows. I'm, I'm not going down the fox sparrow rabbit hole. <laughs> Bob Zink already did that. Um, yeah, they're, they're very different. But I'll, I'll just leave the existing work that is already done as sort of the, the final word on fox sparrows. Okay, another Good. question. Mountain pygmy owls? This is just like... Well, the question is mountain pygmy owl would be another them. good one to check to see how it oh, differs yeah. or not from yeah, the other pygmy owls. Have, yes, yes, yes. I mean, this is one that we've had uh, we've done a couple forays into looking for um, just like differences in the size and, 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 you know, bill and wing and tail of the pygmy owls. And we haven't found anything super interesting in the phenotype, but it's definitely ripe for study. And I think what we haven't done is look at the DNA and that could get really interesting. We, we do, we have a pretty sizable collection of pygmy owls. Oh, good, good, good. Yeah. How, how much does it cost to do sequencing for one species using your method of conserved DNA? It, it's pretty cheap. I mean, you know, like a study of, let's say, 100 individuals, um, you know, is going to cost probably several thousand dollars in terms of sequencing. Um, the, the people, you know, it's kind of... Pain. The, the people that do it, that's kind of where some of the money comes in. But, but yeah, I mean, you're, you're not talking like huge amounts of money. You're, you're in the thousands of dollars instead of like the tens oh. of thousands. Wow, that's great. Yeah. Um, we have a question. As you probably know, Kimball has uh, quite a few volunteers that help, um, help um, prepare birds. And also, do you welcome, do you at the Mur Moore Lab welcome volunteers? Yeah. Yeah, we definitely do. Um, we kind of have our own bird skinning operation too, and always uh, need volunteers there. Um, but also, you know, just uh, w people that are interested can can come and we can talk and we can see if there's if there's a place for um, some volunteer work to be done. We have a library, we have an archives all as part of the Moore Lab, and those are often fun areas to get involved with the bird collection as well. So um, I'd say just shoot me an email and we can start chatting. Things are a little complicated right now, of course, with access and things, but as, as things continue to open, um, yeah, we can talk. Fantastic. John uh, asks another question. Genetic data, data needed for fox sparrow. Oh, it's more comment. Needed on fox sparrows, needed for near areas of context. Something's missing sure. from Zinc's study. Uh, yeah. John, can you help me out? I'm not sure. Uh, yes, Th that that does need to be done. Okay. I'm definitely not doing it, but <laughs> welcome someone else to. Fantastic. Well, I think the Q and A has 
has finally slowed down. <laughs> I, uh, we, you definitely win the prize for the most post presentation questions. Okay. And it was a fascinating presentation and we love the answers and the questions. And again, thank you very, very much for presenting. Awesome. Thank you so much for the invite. Appreciate and it. This, um, re this um, presentation is recorded and will be uh, on our website. So please, if uh, some of your friends, some friends missed the presentation, you know where you can find it on our website. And with that, thanks again. And uh, I'll see everyone next week for Lance Banner and his ID workshop. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks, Bye. John. Thank you, John. Take care. Thank you.